Welcome back to the Lancaster Patriot Podcast. My name is Chris Hume, and I'm delighted that you are joining me once again for this episode. I hope you are enjoying your Christmas season. We're almost halfway through December, and whenever you get to this time of year, you realize, looking back, how fast the year has gone and how fast the years are going. In fact, as we talked about a couple episodes ago, uh, and even in our last episode with Joel St., Matt Kenitzer, and Dave Stoltzfus, looking back at 2020, and the time has flown by. And uh, two episodes ago, we considered John MacArthur's statements, public statements, public actions, uh, as it relates to suspending the Assembly of the Saints at Grace Church in California. And today I want to look at another pastor, a very, uh, maybe not nationally known, but here in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, the pastor of the largest Reformed church, by my estimation, in the county. That would be Dr. Chris Walker, who is the senior pastor at Westminster Presbyterian Church. And, and I want to address uh, what he said. And again, let me, let me start by saying, why, why do all this? I mean, first, there was, a, there was a comment on that MacArthur video from someone, and they said, are you really taking MacArthur, I think it's supposed to be MacArthur, are you really taking MacArthur to task in 2023? Has there been any stronger voice for the sovereignty of Christ and salvation in the affairs of men that probably than MacArthur in recent decades? You play the fool, here you look foolish. Okay, so I think the mindset, and this is very common whenever you go to analyze, address, and especially in that video about MacArthur, it was mainly setting the record straight because people had been saying to me, hey, MacArthur never shut down, or they've been wanting to hide that truth. And I said, well, let's look at what MacArthur actually said and what he actually did, because if we can't even think clearly about what happened, there's no way we can move forward. And by the way, I mean, I'm sure you're aware of this stuff. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm seeing people, and of course the hospitals have gone, they've been nuts for a while, but um, this, is, uh, this is someone in Lancaster County saying, Lancaster General Urgent Care has COVID protocols back and tried to get me to wear a mask. And of course, it was a purple-haired she-her behind the desk on a power trip. Zero chance I'm complying with that stupidity. Um, that's from a, a man I know in the area here. So these things are, are, are coming back. You know, the extent that they come back to the church, I don't know. And the main point is not whether or not it's going to be the exact same thing that comes back. But if we have not laid a foundation and moved on, or and simply move, if we have not laid a foundation, but rather simply moved on from COVID nineteen without addressing how these pastors and I talked about MacArthur's view of Romans thirteen in the last episode, how they just have a very erroneous understanding. If something like this happens again, I have no confidence that people like John MacArthur or or Pastor Chris Walker, as we'll talk about today would respond differently. In fact, their statements, their public statements, uh, would point in the other direction. And so that's that's why we need to talk about this for, for multiple reasons. You know, this person asks, you know, are you taking MacArthur to task in 2023? Well, no, I mean, in 2020, very early on in April and May, I was, if you want to call it, taking MacArthur to task. Uh, then I talked about MacArthur statements in my book, Essential Service, published in 2020. So it's not like this is coming out now, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, and let's now start to address this. Uh, people have been addressing this for quite some time and calling out people like John MacArthur for their public uh, statements and saying, hey, we're, we're shutting down the Assembly of the Saints. So there are a lot of reasons why this is important. Learning from the past, uh, what's going to happen in the future? So today, what I want to do is I want to address Dr. Chris Walker's uh, comments. These are public comments, or at least the video. Uh, I've been able to find it where he sent it to the church and said, hey, here's why we are still not meeting. Now, by the way, I did invite Dr. Walker to come in to the studio for a public discussion on why he canceled church and allow him to defend his actions or recant of them, and he declined. I know how these conversations often go if you're in a private setting, and I wanted people to hear publicly what Pastor Walker is saying now, three years later. And he declined to do that. Now, I did have a friend set up a private meeting with us, and I was able to meet with Pastor Walker, but that, that's not a great position. Um, one, if I start saying, hey, here are all the things he said in that private meeting, you know, 
that's not really what I wanted to do with that private meeting. I wanted it to be public. Two, you know, it wasn't recorded. You know, it's going to be, oh, you said he said this. Uh, he says, no, I didn't say that. And, and I don't want to put him in that position or me. And that's why I really wanted him to come in and be willing to stand behind his statements and we could publicly engage and I could ask him questions and he could ask me questions and everybody could hear, especially here in Lancaster County and even at his church. Hey, here's what he's saying now about what he did in 2020. I will simply say this. There's no evidence out there that he has, just like the same with MacArthur, that he has repented and said that what he did was wrong. You know, I think that's very clear. Just there's, there's nothing there. Now, I wish I could share more uh, based on the private conversation, but I want to just continue to extend the public invitation for Dr. Chris Walker to come in here and have a public discussion and explain himself uh, as it relates to canceling the Assembly of the Saints and if he would do it again. Uh, I'd really like people to hear what I heard from, Do from Dr. Walker. Now, I have a video here. This was a video put out by Dr. Walker, and there's also a longer paper. So uh, I'm going to play, play this video in its entirety, and we're going to break it up. But if I'm reading quotes, they might be slightly different than the video because he put out a paper, uh, which was a longer vi version of the video. So, all right, without further ado, I want to get into this. And I know this might not be as interesting to people because obviously John MacArthur is a very well-known figure and um, Dr. Chris Walker is is not as well-known as as John MacArthur, understandably. And so, but for those of you that are not local here, what you're going to hear from Dr. Walker is, I think, still very concerning and it's something that needs to be addressed. And it is addressed in my book, Scattering the Sheep, and it needs to be dealt with because these pastors have assumed for themselves this nanny-like authority where they tell people, you know, when they can and can't meet with their church family. So he gives, a, I guess you could say, an articulate defense of what he did, but I don't think that it's, it's sufficient. And I think it's, it's very revealing of, of the mindset that I believe is still operating at this church in many churches. So let's let's begin. Let's go through this clip, and we'll make application to any church that shut down. But this will be spe specifically relevant uh, here to Westminster Presbyterian Church in Lancaster County. So I have this divided up into several clips. So let's start with this clip. This is the introduction to Dr. Walker's video, where he's he's been closed already for some time, and and some of his people are asking him when they're going to open. And so this is this video is his response to that, where he's defending why they're still not open. Greetings, Westminster. It's good to talk with you again at the end of another week. And I continue to pray that you and your families are doing well as our time in quarantine lengthens. This morning for our devotional, I wanted to do something a little bit different. We've often brought messages from passages of scripture that are encouraging as we go through this time. But as our time lengthens that we are not meeting together for worship, the, the natural question that comes up is, well, when will we meet again? And I'm particularly eager that our, our congregation would be not only wise, but biblically faithful as we make decisions both to suspend worshiping together and to decide when we'll meet together again. And so I wanted to take a minute this morning just to go through the key scriptural principles that guide us as we make these decisions. All right, so that's Dr. Chris Walker, Westminster Presbyterian Church here in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And he's saying, all right, I'm, I'm going to lay this out for you. I'm going to give you the biblical principles for why we're still in quarantine as a church, and as our time lengthens, people are asking when we will meet again. Now, actually, I mean, Dr. Walker reopened sooner than MacArthur, officially at least. So, but that is really besides the point. The question here is, does the pastor have the authority to act as a nanny and tell the church that they can't gather together? And also, um, is, it his, is it not his duty to gather with his sheep? So, Let's go through this. All right, that was just the introduction. Now he's going to give uh, he's going to give three reasons why you should cancel the assembly of the saints. And I want to spend a little time on this. I address these three reasons in my book. So some of the stuff here uh, you may not ever get a copy of the book. You might hear some of it here. Uh, there's probably stuff in the book that I won't cover here, and maybe some things that I cover here that aren't in the book. But I want us to address these arguments because Doctor Walker's arguments are, I would say, ultimately the final resting place for arguments that can be made in terms of shutting. I think they're, they're fallacious, they're erroneous, they're not biblical. 
but I don't think there's are any other arguments than the ones that he presents uh, as far as that people would continue to use to this day and will use moving forward. So his first reason has to do with valuing human life. All right, so listen to what he says here, and I want us to address this. He says, because we are required to value human life, then in this case, we should cancel the assembly of the saints. So listen to Dr. Walker. So first, let's consider the scriptural reasons why we would not meet for worship for a time. There are three reasons that scripture gives us. First, scripture reminds us that we're to value human life. The sixth commandment says, thou shalt not kill, and certainly no one here is contemplating killing anyone. But the Westminster Larger Catechism reminds us that this command comes with obligations to take those actions with pres which preserve life and to not neglect those actions that would take care of those around us. The Old Testament, in fact, in its uh, comments on this command in Exodus 21 offers this command that if a man knows that his ox is a danger to those around him and doesn't take proper precautions and that ox were to kill a man, the owner is to be killed for not taking the necessary precautions to protect life. Jesus also in the New Testament, when talking about the Sabbath day and, and worship, he says that while we're not supposed to work on the Sabbath day, if a man's son or even his donkey falls into a pit, a man would work to get them out to preserve human life. And so first, we're operating on the biblical principle of protecting human life. All right, the biblical principle of protecting human life. So Dr. Walker there goes to the sixth commandment, you shall not murder, and says the application of this is that if there is a danger in meeting physically, then the pastors have the authority to cancel the assembly of the saints. This is ultimately his only argument. Uh, we'll get into some other stuff, but I mean, this is his argument that when there, when danger arises, the pastor has the authority to cancel the assembly of the saints. The pastor has the authority to say, you are not allowed to gather together as a spiritual family and, or, I will not be there. I refuse to gather with my spiritual family in this time. That is the heart of the matter. And, and I believe the Bible does not provide any justification for a pastor who has accepted the call to be a shepherd to say, I will not gather with my sheep. My sheep uh, want to gather with me and I refuse. Now, of course, now once you start making public statements saying, hey, we're not going to meet, and then you can be like, well, yeah, nobody wants to gather with me, so I don't have to. That's because you publicly said that we are canceling the assembly of the saints. I want to look at those passages that he mentioned. He talked about Exodus 21. So I want to turn there because he's using Exodus 21 as justification for a pastor to say to his flock, I will not meet with you as a congregation. Exodus 21, beginning in verse 28. When an ox scores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned, and its flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall not be liable. But if the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past, and its owner has been warned but has not kept it in, and it kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner also shall be put to death. If a ransom is imposed on him, then he shall give for the redemption of his life whatever is imposed on him. And it goes on there. Okay, so the point here in this passage regarding the ox is that you are responsible for your property. You are responsible for your possessions, for your actions. So if I have an ox, and specifically here, if this ox has been known to gore people, has gotten out in the past, uh, it simply says that if the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past, and then it says if the owner did not keep him in and he gets out, now he's liable because he's responsible for the decisions that he makes regarding his property. So if he chooses to have it, to keep an ox that has been known to gore people and he does not keep that ox in and that ox gets out and harms someone, now he's liable. This has nothing to do with a pastor saying, listen, I am going to do my duty and I'm going to be here at this meeting place, whether it's a church building, whether it's a field under a tree, I will be here and I will not turn away anyone from my flock who wants to gather with me. That has that passage in Exodus about the ox has nothing to do with that. The people that want to gather with their shepherd, they are choosing to meet. And the pastor, it's it's his duty. He should be there. Anybody else who wants to gather, 
that's their decision to be there. Now, they have to answer to God if they're like, you know, no, I'm never going to meet with my, my church family. They will give an account for that. But there's nothing in Scripture that says, hey, if you meet with your church family and then harm comes to you because you got in a car crash, uh, you were martyred, uh, you got a disease, that now it's the responsibility of the pastor simply because he was willing to be there and you chose to meet with him. So Exodus 21 regarding the ox has nothing to do with a pastor's duty to gather with his sheep. Uh, He also talks about Jesus and the donkey that falls into a pit. Again, what does this have to do with the pastor meeting with people? I mean, I understand what he's trying to do. He's trying to say, look, the Bible says that life is important. Agreed. The Bible says life is important. Therefore, if you are reckless with your property and, and your property, in this case, an ox gets out and harms someone, you're liable for that. Um, if you, if there's a donkey in a pit or, or a child in a pit, life is valuable that you should stop what you're doing and help that person or even that animal. Life is important. Yes, 100%. It does not follow from that. And this is where Dr. Walker is going to get into this very vague, ambiguous territory. It does not follow from that, that the pastor can say to his sheep, I refuse to meet with you as a congregation simply because someone might get hurt. That, 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 can, be, that can happen any Sunday. Uh, we're going to get into later his theology of risk. And so I'm going to save some of this for later where he's going to say, at some point there's blood on my hands if someone gets hurt because I was willing to meet with my people. But his first reason is this idea, well, you know what? We need to protect life. Again, if you're going to be consistent and apply this, apply it across the board. You know, we shouldn't do things that endanger our lives then. And this, and Dr. Walker will not be able to consistently defend that when we talk about missions, when we talk about sharing the gospel, when we talk about any number of things, uh, protecting our family from a violent person. You, you know, you can't, you can't just say, hey, the Bible says that life is valuable, therefore that justifies me refusing to meet with my church. It does not follow. So we're going to expand on that. I want to leave some for when he gets to his theology of risk. But let's go to his second reason, all right? And we'll build on some of these as we go, so we'll revisit this. Let's go to his second reason. His first reason was the Bible says to protect life, therefore that's a reason to consider canceling the Assembly of the Saints. His second reason has to do with loving neighbor. Of course, we heard this all the time in 2020. You got to love your neighbor, so you got to put on this this face diaper and you got to cancel the assembly of the saints. Here's Dr. Walker. The second is that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. You know, Jesus says that the first great commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first great commandment, but the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus is saying that while our first command is to love God, the second command to love our neighbor flows directly from that. We can't say that we love God and then hate our neighbor, as it says in in 1 John. And so, of course, while we would not disobey God's commandment just because our neighbor wants us to, there's a biblical priority to care for and love our neighbor as ourselves. All right, so I know you've heard that, if you're like me, so many times, uh, even up until today when talking about this. So we, got, we have to love our neighbor, and we can't hate our neighbor. And the Im- implication there is that if you gather together as a church, if you gather freely with your spiritual family, the body of Christ in the local church, you are hating your neighbor. I mean, that's what, what he's saying. So again, what in the world does this have to do with assembling freely with your spiritual family? This is, you, you see this being presented as, it, this is a nanny pastor here that's saying, look, someone might get hurt, we have to love our neighbor, therefore we, I, therefore I as a pastor will not meet with you. you know, he's, and you know, say, well, no, I'll meet one-on-one. Okay, but your duty as a pastor is to meet with your flock, okay, to shepherd the flock. And we are talking here about the assembly of the saints, that the sheep, it's their duty. They have a right, as it were, to exercise that duty. And as the, the last person in the world that should be preventing them from exercising their duty and their obligation and their their privilege and the blessing of gathering with their church with their church family, the last person in the world who should be preventing that is their pastor. 
And that's what's happening here. And it's done in the name of protecting life in the name of loving neighbor. And that's, again, so ambiguous. Uh, you know, we can't hate. We're going to be hating our neighbor if we meet. Okay, let's let's keep going here and build off of this. And, and of course, of course, now we have to get to submitting to the government. And we talked about that quite a bit with John MacArthur. But here's Dr. Walker saying, well, we got to submit to the government. In this case, in this case, in Pennsylvania, a recommendation from the government, not even a mandate. Here's Dr. Walker. And the third principle guiding us in our decision not to worship right now is that the Bible encourages us to obey the authorities God has put over us. Romans chapter 13, in fact, says that God has put all governing authorities over us, and to disobey them is to disobey God and incur his wrath. Now, in Pennsylvania, the government has not actually prohibited churches from meeting. Again and again, the governor has said that churches have discretion to decide when they would meet, although it has strongly urged churches not to meet together at this time for the protection of our congregations and our communities. And the passage in Romans 13 offers us a further principle, though, that God has put government in place to protect God's people. The Westminster Confession states that the government's role is to take order and protect the God's church so that they can function properly. I think the principle for us here is that individually we obey our governing authorities, but as a church, when we've been given discretion, we listen to their counsel and their advice given in the proper sphere that God has put them. And only when we would determine that the spiritual risks of not meeting outweigh the physical risks of meeting, would it be appropriate for us to go against the recommendations of our government. All right, there is a lot there, a lot there. I mean, one, when he says, you know, the proper sphere that God has placed them, well, what is that proper sphere Dr. Walker, what is the responsibility and duty of the civil magistrate? And he said to protect people. And that is very vague and there's not much substance there. So if the civil magistrate's job is to protect me, protect me from what? From myself? Could they be, could they be mandating what types of food I eat? Could they be putting taxes on certain foods that they think are less healthy? Uh, I think these things happen, don't they? Is that right? Uh, should the civil government be doing that is their job to protect me or is their job to punish evildoers and my job is to make decisions that would protect my safety and i am to protect my family see this is where again we have this this misinterpretation of romans 13 and the role of civil magistrate in general their role is to punish evildoers according to the law word of god not provide me with protection or security you'll also note of course as i said he clearly acknowledges there in Pennsylvania, the government did not prohibit churches from meeting. So in one sense, for Dr. Walker, the argument of the government is really irrelevant because the government didn't mandate that the churches close down. And if Dr. Walker is going to say, well, we should even do whatever they recommend, then I, you know, I would like to hear Dr. Walker argue for everybody to go to government schools. I'm sure the state would be happy to recommend that. And I don't think Dr. Walker wants to go that far knowing the little that I do know about him. So this this is very inconsistent. This is very ambiguous. Um, and and he, then at the end, he, he's going to get into what we're going to come to in a minute, that only when we would determine that the spiritual risks of not meeting outweigh the physical risks risks of meeting, would it be appropriate for us to go against the recommendations of our government? So this is the standard for Dr. Walker. We have to weigh the risks. It's a constant game of risk analysis. We have spiritual risks, which I'd like to hear him quantify and how in the world he judges uh, once a spiritual risk becomes weightier than a physical risk. Uh, and when physical risk then becomes weightier than spiritual risk, I imagine this could go back and forth every week. You know, when would it be? And then, and only in that case, is it appropriate to go against the recommendations even the recommendations of the government. We're not even talking mandates. We're saying whatever the government recommends, we have to do a risk analysis to see whether or not we should follow what they say or we should follow what the Bible says when it calls us to gather together. Okay, those are his three, his three reasons, and we're going to come back to them. So number one, protect life. Since the Bible values life, um, we have to say, you know what, maybe we shouldn't meet because there's danger here. Number two, uh, love your neighbor as yourself. So therefore, that's a reason to cancel the Assembly of the Saints. And number three, submit to government, in this case, recommendations. Okay, I know I just briefly touched on those. We're going to come back to them 
in a moment. But what he does next, and this is where you see the, the conflict in, in the minds of, of men like this, where he's going to say, you know what, but we are, we are still commanded to gather together. This is a positive, moral, perpetual command. He quotes Westminster. This is what we, this is our duty. Uh, and he says all that, and then he's going to go back to justifying being closed. So I just want to play these because this reveals to me, you know, the cognitive dissonance, the, the conflict within the minds of men who scattered the sheep and then, you know, tried to justify it. You know, this is back in 2020, even then saying, well, yeah, I know we have to do this. I know this is our duty, but how can I justify this to my own conscience and to my people to say, but it was still right to, to not meet. So here's him saying, you know what, though, uh, we really are commanded to do this. These are the principles that remind us why we are not meeting right now, but Scripture also gives us strong commands on the priority of worshiping together. In fact, Westminster's leaders are just as concerned that we would be faithful to meet together as we are, that we should guard human life and obey those that are, that are over us. I think the biblical uh, commands for why we worship together should also be quite strong in our minds. He said that Westminster's leaders are just as concerned that we would be faithful to meet together as they are that, you know, we don't meet because it's not safe. I mean, are you just as concerned? Ultimately here, what led you to close the church was that you said we are more concerned, right, about the physical risk than we are about the spiritual risk. You can't, you can't do this and be like, they're equally concerned. You, you, one has to be more important than the other. And the same thing like with MacArthur saying, hey, we know that there's nothing more central than the assembly of the saints. Y you can't say that, you know, consistently, and then shut your church for four months and to say, well, you know, yeah, we're just as concerned about the spiritual risks. Well, no, you're not. One is more weighty to you. And, and obviously it's the physical because you say it's a, hey, we're going to be shut down for however long until we think that the physical risk has subsided. So this is not honest. It, it, at least it's not consistent. Um, and then he calls these biblical commands. Okay. And he's going to go through the, the biblical commands to meet. And it's just interesting to hear people, you know, say, look, th this is, we're commanded to do this, but we're not going to do it because we might get hurt. So he here's what he says. First, scripture makes it clear that gathering for worship is, is a command of God. In the Old Testament, where we're told to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. And Israel was told that the Sabbath day was a day for a holy convocation of God's people. In the New Testament, the church again repeatedly meets together on the first day of the week after Jesus rises from the dead. We see this pattern repeatedly, which is why the Westminster Confession says that meeting together as God's people on the first day of the week is a, a positive, moral, and perpetual commandment. All right, so there it is. He says this is a positive, moral, perpetual command. Now, at some points, he, he would go back to say, well, for example, Jesus and the disciples uh, plucking the heads of grain and then David eating the showbread in the Old Testament and say, look, see, there are some commands that are more weightier than others. But the command to gather is, when you say it's a positive, moral, and perpetual command, that's a weighty command. This is not like some fringe thing where you can be like, well, it's more important that we follow the weightier matters of the law than that we gather together as a body uh, on the Lord's day. So this is inconsistent. I mean, what he's saying in these sections is a strong case for obeying God rather than man. And, that, you know, MacArthur would do the same thing. He'd be like, we have to obey God rather than man, you know, w when it comes to that. And it's like, okay, well, it's, it came to that very early on. The first week that they told churches to, to suspend the assembly, it came to that, and you didn't do it. Uh, which, by the way, with MacArthur, as I was reviewing some of that stuff, and I didn't mention this in that episode, but he, he said in the beginning— you know, if this was a matter of persecution, then we would disobey right away. But then later, when he still closed down, hasn't opened yet, he's like, yeah, it's pretty clear now that they're doing this unfairly targeting, you know, churches or religious places. And he still didn't open. So again, so, so much inconsistency uh, there. Okay, so he says this, Dr. Walker says this is a command and uh, it is our duty. It's a positive, moral, and perpetual command. And now he's going to talk about the benefits of meeting together. But it's not just a commandment. Meeting together as God's people is also a tremendous blessing. God's word describes the blessings of corporate prayer 
uh, multiple times in the Old Testament. In Old and New Testament, we're told about the, the blessings of singing together. I know in talking with many of you, one of the things we miss more than anything else is corporate singing. And Colossians 3 tells us to encourage one another, to admonish one another with psalms and hymns and, and songs to one another. These are blessings of meeting together. I think we can also remember Jesus' own promise when he says that when two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. I think the blessings of being together as God's people are why the psalmist says, One thing I have asked of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. So if I could encourage us, I would hope that the, the comforts of our couch and our pajamas, our, our coffee, and our extra hours of sleep in the morning should not lull us into forgetting that being together with God's people is a tremendous blessing. All right, that last part was hard to listen to. But, uh, I mean, there again, the, the first part of that and the, and the initial part, the last video of, hey, this is a command. I mean, this is like Jesus saying of the Pharisees, hey, listen to what they say. I mean, they sit in Moses' seat. I mean, Dr. Walker now, he, he's saying the right stuff. This is what we're commanded to do. That This is a great benefit to you. This is super important. And the next thing he's going to say is that it's essential. He's going to say the same thing MacArthur did, essentially, that church is essential. I mean, they, they say the right stuff when they get into their doctrine mode, but they don't do it. They're not leaders who do what they say. I mean, that's what Jesus said about the Pharisees. Do what they say. Don't do what they do, all right? And my application to that is, look, you know, here he's saying the right things because he has to, but his actions are not consistent with what he says here. And pastors that will, will act like this and not repent are, are a big problem in the church in America, generally speaking. And, and they, we, they need to repent, and the people that, would go and sit under a man like this, I would just plead with them to consider, are you helping the church move forward? That local church and also the wider community by continuing to enable pastors like that to say one thing and then act completely contrary to it. Uh, what else did he, did he say there? Uh, you know, a tremendous blessing to meet together. Yes, absolutely. There's so many reasons beyond the fact that it's a command that gathering together strengthens people, especially in times of national crisis, which the crisis in 2020 was not the virus. It was the government response and the pastors kowtowing to it. That was the crisis. And it was, it, it, it was devastating, the government tyranny that ensued from that. And we should always follow God's commands. We could argue that even more important to gather together in a time like that, when people are struggling, when people have anxiety, when people are scared, and that's the time that you say we're not going to meet together, that's, that's concerning. All right, uh, let's go to his final reason that we should gather together, okay? These are his three reasons why, you, you know, we should do this. Uh, here is the next video, or next clip. Then thirdly, the scripture also makes it clear that gathering together as God's people is essential for the church. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 say, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This verse reminds us that not meeting together puts us at spiritual risk. And to do that as the day of the Lord draws near incurs greater and greater danger. Well, the blessing of meeting together is that it's an anticipation of the day of the Lord when he returns again and we're together with him. And so as that day draws near, it is all the more joyful and all the more important that we meet together and focus on his return soon. Okay, once again, it's essential for the church to meet. Not meeting together puts us at spiritual risk. Okay, again, yes, amen, 100%. Dr. Walker, why couldn't you just follow those principles and say, look, I will be here every Lord's day. I will not turn you away. I am not your nanny. I don't need to tell you when you are allowed to leave your house. I will be here as the pastor. 
I will not turn anyone away who, who comes to me. I mean, that's what the, the great shepherd said, right? That's what pastors are supposed to do. They are to be under shepherds. They are to fault there to, to receive their sheep. How does it say in, in John, John chapter 10? I think someone was talking to me about this recently. John 10, verse 4, when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. I mean, you are to meet with your sheep, and they are supposed to have someone to follow. So you should have just did, should have done what you, what you said here, that we're commanded to meet, that it, it's a great blessing to meet. It's essential that we meet. Again, if you say it's essential and MacArthur says it's essential and then you cancel it and then you say other things are essential, like, well, we can't, we can't shut down the grocery store, right? Because that's essential. So I don't think MacArthur or Dr. Walker would have told his people, hey, don't go to the grocery store, you know, if you need to get food for your family, because that's essential. But then they use the same language about the assembly. MacArthur saying it's the most essential of all things. That's sort of language even more important than eating. And Dr. Walker saying this is essential. And then you shut it down. And you don't give your people the opportunity to come to you. It's it's embarrassing. All right, here's a final final clip on that um, on the on the church's essential argument, and then I'm going to get into the meat of this in terms of his justification for canceling the assembly. So here's the final part of that, talking about how church is essential. As a last brief point on this, I would remind us that while we are concerned to the risk of our community in meeting at this time, there's also a tremendous blessing for our community because the church has a moral vision that our society needs. It has a message of, of peace in the face of a sovereign God, of, of hope in Christ Jesus. And these will be the most evident to our community when, with a spirit of humility, we meet together again. Again, I just, I, I still can't believe it that you can say something like that after shutting down your church and turning away your sheep by telling them you won't gather with them. It is a great blessing to meet. It would have showed the society around us that we value something greater than our physical life. I mean, you, you saw in COVID, the, the lengths people went to, the fear they had that they might get this virus, and the church led the way. Dr. Walker, you led the way in that and now you want to say, well, once we decide to meet, now we'll be sending this message to the world that, you know, we have this peace and hope. And it's, it's, it's so contradictory because I think we'll get into it later. What he says later is, once we determine it's not reckless to meet, once the elders determine that, of course, once the elders determine that for the people now, okay, now it's not too dangerous to meet, it's just a little dangerous, then that'll be a great message to the world because they'll be like, oh man, look at those Christians, they're meeting, but... Your rationale is, well, let's wait till it's not too dangerous, because if it's too dangerous, then it's reckless for us to meet. But once it's a little reckless, then we can send this message to the world that, hey, we're willing to meet even in the face of this danger. Uh, I mean, he, you totally botched it. I mean, I'm just being honest, like, and just own it, repent of it, and we can move on. That you did not send that message. Opening your church up weeks later without repenting and saying, you know what, this is wrong, we shouldn't have done this is not sending any sort of helpful message to the world. It's sending the same message they hear. It, I mean, it's saying, hey, we were afraid, and we all eventually decided to open, but still, it's not that important that we meet because obviously we're willing to close. Okay, let's get into, um, let's get into his theology of risk, okay? So basically, he lays out those two things. He says, hey, here are the reasons not to meet. Here are the reasons to meet. And uh, it's, I got to weigh them out. You know, and it's like, well, what happens when it's 50-50, okay? What if it's right on the precipice there? And how do you even judge that? So let's, let's get into it. This is the heart of Dr. Walker's argument for canceling the Assembly of the Saints, the heart of his argument for refusing to gather with his sheep as a body. He might say, well, I'll meet one-on-one. -on -one. I met one-on-one -on -one with people. It's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about your duty as a shepherd of the flock to be willing to receive your sheep together. And here are your reasons for saying, I will not do that. I will not meet with you. I mean, and I talked about this on the previous episode. If he's consistent, he'd say, go away. Go away, my sheep. You're here. I'm not going to gather with you. Get out of here. If you're consistent, that's what you're going to do. Again, I talk about the idea of a blizzard in the book. I can I can address that today as well, if, if that'll be helpful. 
That's not what we're talking about. And because I'm going to argue that you don't you don't cancel the assembly of the saints even for a blizzard. Again, I've talked about this before. I used to have this idea of the pastors there in the church. Whoever can gather to him gathers with him. You don't need to be a nanny and be like, I'm determining that it's not safe for you to try to travel. I mean, what if someone has a snowmobile? I mean, what if, th- again, this is like, all these things you have to figure out. Once you make yourself into a pastor nanny, it's ridiculous. Um, you find a way to say, hey, here's where I'll be. And it's your duty as a pastor to be there. And if someone, if one of your sheep can't make it, okay, you know, th- that's that's not on you as the pastor. Your job is to be there and to be willing to receive your sheep. So here is his theology of risk, part one. Well, we've seen some biblical commands on why we should not meet right now, as well as biblical commands on why we should meet. How do we weigh these things? I wanted to end just with a couple of brief comments on how Christians think about risk, maybe a a theology of risk, if you will. On the one hand, scripture tells us that we should watch out for danger and avoid it. Proverbs 22, 3, the prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. We're not to act rashly or imprudently. In fact, Martin Luther, writing in the face of a plague, said that there were some who were too rash and reckless, tempting God and disregarding those things that would protect them from the plague. All right, a couple things there. First, he said we considered the biblical commands for why we should not meet and the biblical commands for why we should. That's not true. He considered biblical commands about other stuff, such as an ox goring someone, such as Jesus talking about, you know, you should help a donkey that falls into a pit. Those were not biblical commands about why you should not meet. You have to understand what what he's doing there. There were biblical commands for why we should meet. He quoted them, Hebrews 10, and he talked specifically about meeting. He never, in that first half of that, provided any biblical commands for not meeting. All he did was say, well, here are here are biblical commands related to the issue of, of life uh, and the importance of life. Agreed 100%, Dr. Walker. But that does it does not follow that you can say, therefore, that is a biblical command uh, that relates to not meeting. Because then you have to apply it to, to anything. And if anything is potentially dangerous, then you say, okay, well, th- this could justify me not obeying God. Uh, I might be martyred. Um, if, I, if, I don't, if I don't deny Christ, uh, I'm going to be killed. You know, my, my wife and family are going to be left without a father. You know, I got the biblical commands here to provide for my family. So therefore, it's fine for me to deny Christ because that's a biblical command over here. You got another biblical command over here. And he's pitting them against each other. And the Lord does not do that uh, in his word. He does not do that. And we're not talking here about temporary ceremonial regulations if he goes into the showbread thing. Like, we're talking about the weightier matters of the law here, the what he himself would say is, is a moral, positive, and perpetual commandment um, that the people gather, and specifically for you as a pastor, that you gather with your sheep. Uh, he, he asks, how do we weigh these things? And the answer is, Dr. Walker, you can't. You, you are not competent. I am not competent. There is no man competent to weigh physical risk versus spiritual risk when it comes to gathering with the saints. At best, that's an individual decision for the Christian to make between him and the Lord in the liberty of the Christian conscience. If he cannot make it somewhere on the Lord's day, if he steps out and attempts to travel and he can't make it and he's turned back, okay. But you are not in a position, you do not have the competence, and I do not have the competence to be like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do a risk analysis every Lord's day and say, okay, I think now... There's still a risk. It's above average risk, but it's not super above average. So the, the physical risks don't outweigh, don't outweigh the spiritual risks if we don't meet. I mean, this is what Dr. Walker has to do. And he quotes Luther, and I'm not going to get into it. I, I mean, I quote Luther in both the books I've written on this topic. And it's just interesting. Usually when, when people like Dr. Walker quote Luther, um, and maybe they say the same about me, oh, you're picking what you want. But, but Luther said specifically, if you are a pastor, you cannot abandon I mean, the, the letter was about whether or not you abandon the town, whether you flee the town because it has the Black Plague. And Luther's saying even there, if you are a pastor, you cannot abandon the town. And he says, now, if you have enough pastors and you say, okay, I'm going to stay, and one of the pastors says, all right, you got this, I'll leave. But he says, pastors as a whole cannot abandon a town, okay? How much more, you know, 
abandon your church and say, well, I won't gather with you. And I don't have any, and Luther's not the standard, the Bible is, but I don't see any evidence that Luther, in fact, I see the opposite. I don't see any evidence that Luther said, well, you don't gather with the church. In fact, in that letter where he's answering the question of whether or not it's right to flee during the plague, and he does talk about recklessness, but in the same letter he says, the first thing we need to teach people to do during this time when they're fearing death is that we need to tell them to go to church. That's what Luther says, because he knows if death is before you, and the COVID, COVID was not like the Black Plague, but if death is before you, you need to know how to live and how to die. So I just don't understand this quoting of Luther to be like, oh, yeah, Luther talks about recklessness, but we are talking here about the assembly of the saints, and Luther himself argued that, hey, the first thing we got to teach people is that they got to gather with the church. They got to go to church. So uh, that's part one, and we're going to get into his risk continuum here. So let's go to parts, uh, this is uh, point two and three, as it relates to the theology of risk. So that's his initial hey thing, hey, I got to weigh these things, and he's already, I think, uh, misrepresenting the situation by saying we have biblical commands here not to meet, and biblical commands here to meet, and we have to weigh those. That's not true. We don't have biblical commands not to meet. We simply have biblical commands to meet. Okay, and but now he's going to try to weigh these things against each other, and let's see how he does that. And yet, fear of potential risk is not our primary guiding principle. In our society today, which has very little moral compass, the safety of a thing is often the only criterion left to decide whether we should do something or not. And the church does not operate in that same compass. We do have principles to live by. And the church, in fact, believes that while our physical life is important, our spiritual life is even more important. Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and then to lose his soul? If we're worried about preserving our physical lives, how much more should we be worried about preserving our spiritual lives? As one author asked, if all we have to show for our efforts is that we survive, is that real prudence? I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I don't understand how you can say these things and still close down your church. I, I don't understand. I don't know if this is like a, you're saying these things to placate your conscience, say, well, at least, you know, I believe these things, but I, I don't, I don't do them and I don't repent uh, of doing them, you know, after the fact. Fear of, he says, fear of potential risk is not our primary guiding principle. Was it not? If the primary principle was to meet and obey the command, then why not do that? See, this is again this this is not this is not clear. This is not accurate. This is not this is not consistent with how you acted. He says we we do have principles to live by, and you're like yes, we have principles to live by as Christians who've acknowledged those principles. Everyone should live by them. But we've acknowledged them. We've professed that Christ is our Lord. And our obedience to him is more important than our physical safety, right? And, and he makes this case, well, in our society, safety is the most important thing. That's what you're arguing for. You're saying if the safety is, if the risk is too much, that outweighs everything else. And it will allow me to say as a pastor, I will not meet with you. There's no other way to explain that. I mean, see, he should be honest and say, you know, no, no, it's, you know, safety can be, safety is primary because once the safety has more weight, it, it wins the day. And the biblical position would be, look, you follow Christ, you obey Christ, even if it means that this could cost you your life. That's not saying like, hey, your physical safety is, is the most important thing. That's saying the spiritual, if you will, the principles we live by are the most important he says, how much more should we be worried? So he, so he says here, he says, our spiritual life is even more important than our physical life. How much more should we be worried about preserving our spiritual lives? That, that was his mentality in that clip. Yes. Yes, Dr. Walker. How much more should we be concerned about our spiritual lives when any crisis, maybe when a real a uh, real serious virus comes along. People are like, oh, you're you're making light of COVID nineteen. People died from that. People die from the flu too. Okay, I'm not, you know, I'm not making light of that by saying that the flu is not some serious black plague. Okay, maybe we do have a serious serious virus that comes along one day. It didn't happen in 2020. Maybe we have one that does, and you have no basis to to stand. Then you're going to say, oh, we can't meet now. You know, it's there's too much of a risk to our physical well being. Again, this is what I talked about with MacArthur. 
it's hypocritical in, in the textbook definition of the word. You're saying one thing and you're acting another. You're putting on this face of meeting is essential. God commands it. We, we need to do it. Our spiritual life is more important than our physical life. You say all these things and then you don't live that out. You shut down the assembly of the saints. And in Dr. Walker's case, the first week back requiring masks uh, for people to come and take the Lord's Supper. If you didn't wear a mask, you were not welcome uh, in that church. That was for one week. Doesn't make it right, especially when you don't repent of it. And repenting is not saying, all right, uh, we won't do that anymore. And, and with no recognition of wrongdoing. Um, and I've heard none from Dr. Walker in terms of admission of wrongdoing. Um, all right, I want to tie all this together, but I want to finish his, his clip here on his theology of risk. So here's his last little part of that. And I think there's only one more clip after that. But not only do we have this priority of our spiritual lives, the church also acts in trust in its sovereign God. Well, God's sovereignty, of course, does not lead us to recklessness. It does give us a peace that allows us to take appropriate risks to do the things he's called us to do. We think of things like Psalm 46.10, where we hear, Be still and know that I am God. Or Isaiah 26.3, where it says, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. We have solid truth to give us courage in the face of minimal risk to proceed in ways that will benefit our souls to the glory of God. Okay, again, I mean, I, this is just very shallow. I, I'm not trying to be, people say, oh, you're uncharitable. I, I'm trying to be honest with what this is. And again, I've I've met with Dr. Walker. I first invited him in publicly. I, I plead with him again to come in publicly um, so people can hear his response to this. But listen to what he said there. He said, we have solid truth to give us courage in the face of minimal risk, you know, to, to proceed with, with these things. I mean, wow, that, you know, it's so inspiring. This truth can help us in the face of minimal risk. I don't know if you caught it. And in fact, in the, in his article or his, his longer paper on that, he says, okay, here it is. He says, it is likely that many unbelievers will not understand our desire to take even minor risks but we fear God and trust in him first and not man. So he's, so he, this is the conclusion of his, what I call his risk continuum, his, his, his weighing. Uh, at some point, this becomes too risky. But when the risk isn't that serious, you know, then, then we can have courage in the face of minimal risk. I mean, he said that in the video. It, this solid truth can give us courage in the face of minimal risk. Really? That's, that's all that the, the glorious message of the cross can do and the truth of God's word and our duty to meet together and, and what that means and represents uh, that solid truth can only give us courage in the face of minimal risk. What about in the face of maximum risk? Namely, Hey, if you gather here and you proclaim Christ, you could die, whether that's from a, a from a, you know, persecution, which happens by the way. And the pastor say, Oh, well you can flee persecution. Yeah, I know you can flee persecution, but you can't abandon Christ and you can't abandon your flock. You know, it's... So, uh, in the paper, he uses the phrase minor risks. In the video, he says minimal risks. And his argument is like, hey, once once the risk isn't too bad, or uh, once the risk is reaches a certain lower level, then it's an appropriate risk. Uh, he says, you know, we got trust in God's sovereignty. It gives us peace to take appropriate risks. This is milksop talk. I mean, this is like, hey, once, you know, and he's the one that determines that. So as the pastor, he's the one that decides when the risk is appropriate for his people to gather. And that's not his duty. That's not his job to decide for his people when they are willing to risk their lives for obedience to Christ. Leave that in their hands, pastor. Give them, you, you're, you're defrauding them of the opportunity to make that, that judgment and to say, I will be faithful to Christ, whether that's meeting in this church in a communist land that I know I could die if I do this, or whether that's gathering with your spiritual family when there is a deadly virus with a high death rate, which was not the case in 2020. But even if it was, give your people the chance to do that. You, you are not God. You are not a nanny. You are not a risk analyst. analyst. You, you are a pastor of this flock 
of God, and your job is to be there to gather with them. So, I mean, this to me, the conclusion here was very troubling. It's, it's again, it's more saying, it's this grandstanding, like, oh yeah, we're, we're going to be bold in the face of minimal risk. We're, we're, we're going to be faithful when it's appropriate. And these pastors, I'm telling you, they draw near to God with their lips, but their hearts are far from Him. And you know what it says next? Teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. And that's what happened in 2020. You had these pastors teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. Hey, don't meet. Governor said it. Fauci said it. Whoever, don't do it. That's the, that's the, that's the commandment of men, and you're teaching that as doctrine that your church has to follow. And then you say all these things, you know, these nice sounding things, you know, it's essential that we meet. It's the most essential of all things. And then you don't meet with your flock. Very, very discouraging. And again, I I would, I hope people can understand. I know some people, I know some people are going to say, this is pointless. You're mean spirited. Uh, You know, why, why are you bringing this up? You have no right to bring this up. And I, I know those people are out there and I pray that they would see that this is more important than the personalities. This is about the example of the Church of Jesus Christ to the world. This is about the duty of pastors to meet with their sheep. And something is going to happen in the future. It might not be a virus. It might be something else. And I have no confidence that these pastors who didn't repent, I have no idea how they'll respond because... Dr. Walker's, um, his rationale is a risk continuum. I'm going to pull up this graphic on the screen if you're watching this. And this is basically how Dr. Walker views it. There's always risk um, to any Christian who gathers with, with the flock. There could be more perceived risk and less. I mean, I don't even know how you judge that, you know. Um, but his, his, his theory is, is that at some point in that continuum, and that's why there's question marks there, I don't know where it starts, he doesn't know, he, he can't quantify this. At some point in there, there's blood on his hands if, if someone dies in the course of gathering with their spiritual family. And this is the idea with the blizzard, like, oh, if I don't cancel the assembly of the saints when there's ice on the road, and someone travels to meet with their spiritual family, and they die... It's my fault as a pastor because I didn't cancel the assembly of the saints. That is nonsense. Okay. That's not your job as the pastor to do that. Your job is to, to be there for your flock. Now you can't be in all places at all times. You can be one place as a pastor. So wherever you are on the Lord's day, receive your sheep that come to you. Okay. It's it, this is not complicated and we've only made it complicated with, you know, all the modern stuff and people spread out. We don't have the parsonage anymore. And, and you, you can come up with backup plans, but the point is the shepherd does not turn away his sheep. There's no need to cancel the assembly of the saints. Okay. You meet with your sheep, but the only justification that Dr. Walker or anyone will have to say, Hey, we are authorized to say, Hey, we're canceling this and I'm not going to meet with you. Uh, because it might be dangerous for you, and if you get hurt, it's my responsibility. That's a man-made burden, a man-made tradition that I pray Dr. Walker would be relieved of because it's causing him to overstep his bounds where God has placed him and to make decisions uh, regarding whether or not the flock can gather with their shepherd. That's your duty. It's your duty, man, to gather with the flock. Okay, so that's that's his his the risk continuum. I mean, I came up with that graphic, but that's the logic of what he's saying. At some point in there, this becomes too dangerous, and then if anyone gets hurt, now there's blood on the pastor's hands. I want to know wherever he draws, you know, wherever he puts that line that hey, this is the point. If it goes beyond that, then it's my responsibility. So like, you know, one centimeter before that, if someone does die gathering with the church, then there's no blood on his hands. This is a man-made stuff because, and you have to, because the Bible doesn't give you the, the authority to do that, Pastor Walker. Your job is to be there to meet with your sheep as a flock. Okay, I want to play the last clip, and then we are, we are done with Dr. Walker's video. The, after this clip, you'll have seen the full video that Dr. Walker sent justifying canceling the Assembly of the Saints. 
Now, as I conclude, I would just encourage us as a congregation, I'm sure there's going to be many questions as we try to make these decisions of when to start worship again. Some will undoubtedly fear that we're going too quickly. Others will feel like we're moving too slowly. But if I could just encourage us that Satan could have a heyday if we begin to be frustrated with one another over our positions that we take. And I would just encourage us as a congregation that this is our opportunity to show that our unity comes in the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, not because we think alike in different ways. And so I'd encourage us to remember Ephesians chapter 4, that we should walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I'm including a longer written summary of these principles for, for you to read, but I hope this guides us as a congregation as we seek to be both wise and faithful to Scripture. And I would ask that you be earnestly praying for us as your leaders as we seek to make these decisions to the glory of God. All right, so that was his conclusion to the matter. Um, and this this was common as well. Hey, if you if you're doing something like I'm doing now or the books I've written, you know, you're playing into Satan's uh, Satan's uh, schemes here instead of just let's just have unity. And you'll you'll note there that he said, you know, unity does not come by on is not based on thinking alike or even acting in a, in concert with biblical truth, but unity uh, is just based on the body you know, on the blood of Christ. And obviously that's the foundation of our unity if we are in Christ, is that we are all washed with the blood of Christ. We are all forgiven. We are all part of the family of God by the blood of Christ. But unity in the local church is, is, is more than that. I mean, and I know Dr. Walker would say that in another situation. And he's saying, look, unity is not based on thinking alike. Unity is not based on acting like, really? Uh, this is Romans 16. I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. And this passage was used against people who would call out their pastors. I think it's the, the exact opposite. Paul says, there are those who cause divisions and create obstacles. Okay? That, to me, would be at least a biblical understanding of like, hey, if we need to have unity around the truth, around sound doctrine and sound practice. That's the unity we want. But Paul says there are those who will create, cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine you have been taught. And my question is simply this, who created, who caused divisions and created obstacles contrary to the doctrine in the Bible? Was it the Christians that said, hey, we should be meeting the pastor should be gathering with the flock, with his sheep that want to gather with him. Or was it the pastors who said, we are not going to follow what the Bible says? Which one created the obstacle contrary to sound doctrine? It was the pastors who canceled the assembly of the saints. And again, this was another tactic, and I'm sure I'll hear it again. Oh, you're causing division. You're creating obstacles. You're destroying the unity of the church. The pastors did that when they canceled the assembly of the saints, when they refused to, the, to repent. This is what the pastors did who scattered the sheep. They caused the division. They created the obstacles. They said, you are not allowed to get, they made it an obstacle. I know for me, for people I know, for many of us, okay, how are we going to gather now with our, our spiritual family? The obstacle was created by the pastor. I would have gone to our normal meeting place on Sunday and listened to my pastor preach and fellowship with my fellow saints. Uh, that's what I would have done, but there's an obstacle now in the way to doing what God calls me to, and it was put there by the pastors who scattered the sheep. So yeah, I, I agree, if you want to put it like that, Satan had a heyday, but it was not because of people calling on their pastors to be faithful. It was because of pastors who scattered the sheep. So um, th that's that's a brief summary of, of Dr. Walker's arguments, and I just think they're woefully inconsistent. And, you know, uh, out of one side of his mouth, he's arguing how important it is how, to be faithful, and then on the other side, he says, well, you know, the risk is just too high right now. And embedded in all of that is this nanny mentality that the pastor is responsible for the individual actions of his sheep, like with with them acting within the liberty of the Christian conscience, obeying God's word to gather, and the pastor is responsible to prevent them from doing that, 
that's not biblical. The pastor is to watch for your soul, okay? And his job is not to say, hey, now I allow you to take a risk for the kingdom of God. Because Dr. Walker will say, well, once there's minimal risk, once there's minor risk, well, yeah, then we should stand bold, and then I'll allow you peons in the pews to, to come and gather with me. But if it's more than minimal, if it's some higher level of risk, I do not al- allow you commoners to, um, to, to gather with your shepherd and put yourself in danger. It's a nanny mentality. Um, that's what it is, plain and simple. Again, why does this matter? There's so many things we could say. I can't rehash them all right now, but uh, something else is coming in the future. There's always something else. There's always threats, and there's always temptations for the church, for the pastors to cave, to, to be given over to worldliness, uh, fear of man, uh, walking uh, in fear, not faith. And so if we don't address this, if we don't deal with this, if the parishioners at Westminster, I would say, simply put, if Chris Walker, at this point, three years later, uh, if he won't repent, and you are concerned about this, and you continue to go there, I'm not sure how that's leading the, Dr. Walker to repent. There's a lot more I could say. Um, I just wish Dr. Walker would come in so this could be a publicly recorded conversation um, because I just want to stick to what he said there in that video and in his paper. Um, but I, I really would would ask him to come in, and if you are there, encourage him to come in. And if he believes what he did was right, which he he says he does, then come in and defend it. And also, at the same time, if you're going to be consistent, call out those churches that did not cancel the Assembly of the Saints and say that they were violating the Sixth Commandment and that blood is on their hands. Um, because it's nice to, to say this and to not back them up. Like, if you really believe that it would have been sinful to gather with your flock, then say that very clearly. Because one thing I don't want to be accused of is not being clear and not being uh, you know, articulate, like, hey, here's the problem, and here's what we need to do to, to fix it. And I think there's a lot of ambiguity and lack of clarity in statements like this from Dr. Walker, from MacArthur, so on and so forth. Well, I was talking to someone, John Bingaman, and he said, yeah, well, it's very simple that the reason these guys won't admit they're wrong, because if they admit they're wrong, then they won't be able to do it again. And of course, uh, there's truth to that. And uh, in fact, I think these these pastors will will do the same thing if the right conditions are in place. Now, if it's the same exact thing, they might be like, all right, well, we're not going to close down this time. We won't say we were wrong that time. But if something else comes up, they're going to do it again. And if they say they were wrong, eventually their pa- their congregants might be like, well, hey, wait a minute. You said it was wrong to shut down for that. And now you're shutting down again or doing something else. And so uh, th- this stuff does matter. So thank you for listening. I encourage Dr. Chris Walker, if you uh, know him, I uh, encourage him to come in for an in-person discussion where he can answer some questions about what he did, about what he'll do in the future, about if he did any wrong, uh, about if the government did any wrong. And he can he can challenge me and say, you're off the rails, Chris. It's not the pastor's duty to meet with his sheep. Um, that's not his, that duty uh, is only uh, viable when there's not a certain level of risk. Once there's risk, then the pastor can say, I'm not going to meet with you. I'm not going to gather with you. Stay away. So he, he can make that case. Uh, I don't think he made it in that paper or that video. I'd like to hear it. So thanks again for listening. Uh, check out the book, Scattering the Sheep. Share it on social media and encourage pastors to repent. And if not, uh, let's find men who will walk boldly Uh, even when there's more than minimal risk. Thank you for listening. Uh, If you want more information, go to LancasterPatriot.com to support our show and to get some extra content. Go to Patreon.com slash The Lancaster Patriot. Until next time, remember that Christ, not man, is king. So long.